So um, that KFC case thing was maybe indeed uh, a, bit, a bit of a missed opportunity, but on the facts, I think it was probably uh, difficult to argue uh, legitimate expectations at all uh, before we even got to how far they would have taken uh, the company in European law. But indeed, and I think that's something we'll come, come back to this afternoon, uh, the principle of legitimate expectations in state aid law uh, as an argument against recovery uh, it doesn't hold out much uh, chance of success. Um, so to conclude, um, where are we now when it comes to recovery? There is no, there is no general legal basis uh, in Dutch law, um, and uh, there has been considerable debate in the literature as to how far uh, courts can require recovery and whether they can just rely on the direct effect of the European uh, Treaty Article, Article 108. So if the Commission has adopted a decision that has direct uh, effect and therefore enters into the Dutch legal order and that is a sufficient legal basis. Um, now, the question of, of how far that goes, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, came uh, to a head in this Fleuron, Fleurin compost case. And the, the Fleurin compost case um, was, a, again, a fairly complex case which involved timing uh, going a bit wrong. Um, and it, it, it involved um, uh, capital grants that were given to um, producers of manure um, to process their manure in, in various ways that were more environmentally friendly. And uh, the scheme was approved by the European Commission for a particular time window. Um, and two applicants, one, one of them being Fleur and Compost, were a bit late uh, in getting their application in. And so they actually missed the boat, which meant that um, their aid, the aid they got, um, if they had completed all the procedures, uh, let's say, uh, and this case goes back to uh, the year 2000, if they completed the case, their application in February 2000, they would have been all right, but they were actually six months late, and therefore uh, they uh, did not qualify for the aid under uh, the national scheme as approved by the Commission. The Commission therefore found the aid to be legal. Um, it was an unfortunate procedure um, uh, in that uh, it, it seemed that when the Commission was looking into the case, um, it didn't get much information from the Dutch government, and I don't know why, uh, and the Dutch government also failed to tell Fleurin uh, that this investigation was going on. So Fleurin did not have the opportunity to make its own observations uh, to the Commission at a, an early stage. Um, so the sad story was that in the end, uh, some uh, 500,000 euros had to be recovered from Fleurin. Not maybe a large amount of money, but enough for Fleurin to say, no, uh, uh, we are challenging this, uh, it's an unfair procedure, we were not properly informed. Um, uh, so uh, the Dutch government also uh, then failed to collect uh, the money. Um, there was very informal contact with the Commission. Uh, eventually, um, attempts were made. Um, and um, some of the money, but not all of it, uh, was then collected uh, through administrative procedures, uh, which were upheld by the Council of State, but not the full um, interest. Uh, the, the, the court said um, that the, the base, there was no basis um, in Dutch law for uh, recovering interest in full, and they did not accept that uh, European law uh, provided that basis without a legal basis in Dutch law. Um, 
Now there's a lot of commentary about that uh, approach. Uh, but it seems that, uh, at least in Dutch law, um, part of the argument is now resolved uh, by a more recent case involving uh, risk equalization funds in, in the health sector, um, where um, relying on a case called Somavo, Somvao, which Somvao, uh, uh, which actually uh, concerned a fund for Somalian refugees that was partly uh, funded by European funds and partly by national Dutch funds. Um, it, the court has finally said uh, and confirmed uh, at the highest level that uh, we the Dutch courts should rely on the direct effect of Article 108 combined with the principle of, of loyalty uh, in the treaty um, to require recovery uh, in full. But it still did not settle the issue of the interest. Now the Dutch Risk Equalisation Fund case is also an interesting case. Um, this concerns uh, the health uh, our, the health system in the Netherlands, uh, where we have a mixture of compulsory and uh, voluntary insurance. Um, and when the, the health system was reformed to introduce this mixed system, um, in order uh, to make sure that private insurers um, would cooperate uh, if with the reforms, this um, an equalisation fund was set up so that the losses that these uh, insurance companies um, sustained for giving um, coverage, uh, complete coverage, no matter um, whether the, the, the people who were insured were previously uh, very sick or long-term sick, uh, um, those losses could be covered through this uh, equalisation fund. Now, that, when that scheme was set up, um, it was notified to the Commission as a possible form of aid um, because it was, you can, you can see from the word risk uh, equalisation, you were actually giving an advantage to some companies because you were removing a commercial risk uh, that they would, an insurer would normally incur. Uh, the Commission approved the scheme uh, on uh, the grounds that it was compatible with Article 107 of Paragraph 3 uh, and also it was a form of um, uh, service of general economic interest in healthcare. Uh, but there were various conditions uh, imposed so that the compensation that any individual insurer would get would not be higher than its actual losses for giving this um, compulsory <coughs> insurance. So it was a fairly complicated scheme um, and one of the problems was that sort of ex ante you gave a kind of blanket, uh, you gave a, a kind of a blanket insurance to companies that their costs would be covered but still ex post you had to match their costs um, with their entitlement from the fund. So it transpired that several companies uh, seem to get an over-allocation of compensation. Um, and the body responsible for the management of the fund um, checked with the Commission uh, to see whether this is all right, uh, got no reply. And the court itself then, uh, and this is a, a good e example of where a court collaborates with the Commission, asks the Commission for guidance on, on a decision here that the Commission had already adopted. And it asks the Commission then, uh, is this the type of case where you see uh, overcompensation? And the Commission said yes, and therefore that overcompensation had to be recovered from the two companies uh, that had benefited from it. Now, yeah, this was a bit of a difficult case, you could say, because where was the the legal basis for getting that money back. It wasn't in the health legislation that had set up this fund. That was all, it had all come from the Commission, this idea that there had to be some system to stop overcompensation. And so the court in that case, uh, the um, 
our Reverend Staff, the Council of State, said uh, finally, uh, for the first time, that the legal basis then is Article 108 of the Treaty and the principle of uh, the principle of loyal cooperation. So they they had to then uphold uh, the Commission's decision. I suppose that that case could have also been brought on the basis of a, a misuse of, of state aid, um, which also can lead to recovery, but in uh, under the procedural regulation you have to set up an investigation. Uh, the Commission obviously didn't do that and left it to the courts, but cooperated with the, with the National Court. So that's, that's quite an interesting case, I think, uh, uh, where you see then that uh, at national level uh, there was absolutely no legal basis for recovering that overcompensation. Uh, and so the court had to rely then on the general principles. Now the whole issue of interest didn't apply there. Um, but what seemed to be very important uh, for the, the Court of um, uh, Council of State was the, the ruling in this Som Vao case, uh, which concerned um, support um, to the Somalian Refugee um, Association, uh, that's what the Som Vao uh, stands for, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where there had been alleged misuse of funds. Um, and the, the court, again, there, was no, there seemed to be no legal base, clear legal basis in Dutch law uh, to require the reimbursement of the funds. Um, so this case goes to the Court of Justice, um, and uh, there the Court of Justice has to look at the interplay between Dutch law and um, specific rules in uh, EU law on the use of EU funds. Uh, and here uh, the court clearly rules uh, that uh, the basis for getting those funds back at national level is based then on the principle of loyal cooperation. That the courts had to find a legal basis. There was no argument that there was no legal basis. You had to find a legal basis uh, to get the money back. So the, the, the National Court of the Netherlands had to <coughs> devise a system that allowed for uh, the European funds that had been paid uh, to the Somalian refugee organisation back. And here the principle of legitimate expectations also played a role um, in that it was argued, well, if you had no system for reimbursement, uh, then to suddenly come up with one, um, at a later stage to declare ex post that reimbursement of these uh, funds was necessary, that would infringe the principles of, of legal certainty <coughs> and legitimate expectations. Um, and the court, um, the European Court dealt with this uh, in its usual way by saying that's a matter of national law. Uh, so it was for the national court to look to see whether the recipients of these funds um, had complied with all the relevant procedures, and if they had done, maybe that would have been uh, a basis for creating a legal certainty that they could keep the funds, uh, but if they hadn't complied with all those procedures, then they didn't have that basis. Um, so, it seemed then, as a result of, of this very recent uh, ruling, 2015, uh, that we now finally uh, have put to sleep <coughs> the whole discussion about the legal basis of recovery uh, in the Netherlands, um, at least from an administrative law point of view. However, uh, we will still have uh, a law on recovery, and um, I'll come back to why that is still necessary, um, but at least from an administrative law point of view, um, there is no question. Uh, that uh, there is a basis for recovery. And if you take the same approach um, that Article uh, 108 has direct effect and you have um, an obligation of cooperation, that of course applies throughout the national legal system. It's not limited to the national uh, administrative courts in any way at all. Uh, it's just that 
at national level, the administrative courts have recognised that firmly. So, so, so we, from a national point of view, then this whole issue of recover, uh, of interest and what can be recovered. Uh, should be settled. Um, and the other point, of course, uh, that uh, should be settled um, if one has special legislation is the, peri is the limitation period, um, which differs also, uh, which I'll come back to. Okay, so um, we're, at, we're at a stage where we've decided uh, that there is a sound basis for recovery in national law, um, but we still don't have... Um, clear legal framework. And I thought just be, to finish up before looking at the before looking at the new legal framework that's being introduced, um, then just to go back um, to to the way cases are playing out in the Dutch courts um, and to what extent state aid uh, plays an important role, state aid cases. Um, why is the success rate, I, I mentioned we have relative, a relatively high number of cases being brought, uh, but the success rate is very small. And one of the, one of the reasons is um, because uh, of the standing rules. Um, and the standing rules in administrative law uh, were sharpened in 2013 uh, through an amendment that introduced this Oh, okay, no, it's done that. Right. Um, a right to bring in a, a, a case. Yeah, yeah, we call that standing in the end. Yeah, okay, yeah. 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 Uh, admissibility. admissibility. The case has to be admissible. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you, in Holland, in the Netherlands, the, the civil, the minister courts have very strict uh, rules on admissibility. Uh, so you have to have an interest to bring a case. And I put the word in Dutch that it's, that uh, that what you have to show that you have to show the legislation affects you, uh, not just the relative talent So you have to show. Correct me or please uh, help me if we need further explanation here. You have to show that the legislation that you are uh, challenging uh, is meant to affect your interests. Um, so that you can claim protection. Oh, sorry. Um, that you can claim protection under it. Uh, and this is this has meant that, for example, in tax. Uh, um, in tax issues, um, it's very difficult for someone to go to court and say, uh, I'm not paying that tax because it's giving somebody else an advantage. Uh, and that makes the whole tax then illegal. You can't say that. So you, you cannot challenge, uh, as an individual, your general obligation to pay tax just because somebody else uh, gets is maybe an advantage, it's maybe subject to a challenge. And there is one exen this exception recognized uh, um, in, national, in the national courts deriving from uh, European state aid law, uh, where what you're actually saying is that there is a levy, a parafiscal levy, uh, a heffing in Dutch, um, is, is being levied um, and the proceeds of that are going into a special fund, uh, and that fund uh, is then being used as a source of subsidy for competitors. So there, what you're challenging is a tax that's an integral, integral part of the state aid. So that is allowed, and that comes uh, that 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 approach um, has been recognised in in a case. Uh, at the court uh, straight away, and that's recognised in national law. But it's very difficult normally as a taxpayer uh, to go to court and, uh, and claim that the whole tax is illegal because somebody else somewhere has got uh, or could get an advantage. And I think that's the same in every, every system. Um, so, so this 
idea that the administrative court will not give somebody protection um, unless the law is intended to protect them is very important and raises the barrier uh, to procedure very highly to, to make it very difficult then uh, to contest uh, those kinds of um, actions. And I think one of the most controversial cases where this seemed uh, to be applied, that approach, uh, was in, um, in the rescue case of, of one of the big Dutch banks, SNS Real, uh, where the shareholders saw their, 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 their property nationalised uh, and they tried to claim that there was a state aid issue involved, uh, that it was a case of, of um, a haircut, if you like, uh, where the, the, sh the shareholders uh, of the bank that was being nationalised then uh, they saw their interest being wiped out. Uh, they, they, they wanted to claim that this would mean that the bank that, that was being rescued in the process that would remain uh, was receiving some form of state aid. They never got that far uh, because their argument um, that they were, um, their property was being expropriated uh, was not considered uh, to be admissible uh, because the legislation that they were um, contesting was not meant to protect their interests. Now this is quite a controversial case but uh, it is an example of how strict uh, the administrative standing rules or admiss admissibility rules can be. So that, that, that strict approach keeps out a lot of state aid claims. It's a very effective filter uh, in the system. Um, I should mention that we have, of course, other courts looking at state aid, not just uh, the administrative courts. We have um, the industry court, for want of a better uh, translation, which is um, the, the central uh, court <coughs> dealing with the CBB, uh, so CBB sorry, um, which uh, also hears cases. Uh, there's been some interesting cases there. Um, the uh, Admissibility rules are not uh, as strict, but what a lot of um, complainants find is that uh, the standard of review is not as, as, as high as it should be, or, or in the sense that uh, they expect this court, because it's a special court set up to look at individual decisions uh, on um, of, of government authorities, they expect it to, to go beyond a marginal review uh, to a more in-depth review. Uh, now, there's a lot of discussion as to whether that um, happens or not. Um, there have been a number of cases uh, where uh, there has been an alleged state aid given uh, by a public entity that's under the supervision um, of a government regulator. Uh, for example, um, I've given you the example here of the National uh, Transmission System Operator, Tenet, um, where it was alleged that um, it was allowed to buy its regulator to use certain funds um, to buy, to give a guarantee for the purchase of um, um, an electricity exchange where contracts for electricity were bought and sold. Um, so the users, major users of the system, they challenged that as um, possible state aid. Uh, now that case was, was uh, declared um, to be uh, inadmissible uh, because um, they had to show uh, that the, the regulator had no powers uh, to um, approve this use of the money and in fact um, they had failed to discharge that burden. So we didn't get to the actual ins and outs of the state aid uh, arguments. But it was unlikely that that would have been state aid because it was very difficult to show uh, that there were state resources uh, there. Um, so although there have been about 13 cases um, in the last five years at the CPB, um, there's still not been a, a case where it's been held that the state aid rules have been infringed. So there's a lot of activity and state aid arguments are often used um, to, to challenge uh, decisions, uh, but so far there hasn't been one that has resulted in a ruling that there has been state aid, and therefore we don't know uh, how recovery would have been affected. Um, civil courts, 
Um, now here, of course, the standing um, rules are much more generous. Uh, you don't have to show that individual uh, direct interest. Uh, you have to show, of course, that you're, there's a sufficient interest, uh, but it's a much lower threshold. Um, and that has also meant that uh, general success rate, it's not very high, but it's a bit better, it's 25%. And when I say success rate, I just mean that the state aid plea is admissible. Not that it's successful, but the success rate in the sense that the party having entered the plea, um, that there has been a state aid um, involved, at least gets to argue it, get to argue its case. Um, uh, so there are, of course, also um, civil procedures in tax cases, um, and um, you often see this argument uh, that I already mentioned that a particular tax cannot be levied uh, because it's, um, being, uh, it's subject to investigation or it gives an advantage to somebody else. You often see that used in civil cases. Uh, by parties trying to um, avoid paying tax. Um, Can I ask something? Sure. Uh, obviously, that you have uh, um, handled the administrative courts and the civil courts, they do the same thing. How is it in your national law that you can have uh, civil courts or administrative courts stating on the same problem issues? You can you can go to one and lose, but you can still you can pursue the other route. You can choose. You can choose. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a division of admissibility yeah. between those type of yeah. courts. Yeah. Uh, for in civil courts, yeah, it must be. Uh, civil dispute. Civil dispute. Yeah. The possibility of going to a general administrative court, for example, about the taxation question, mm -hmm. is not uh, existing. For in taxation questions, the tax court or the tax judge is exclusively uh, um, uh, in power. But as you told us in the uh, tax, the admiss admissibility for taxation for the tax judge is very strictly regulated, very strictly uh, uh, signed because you can all, only go to the uh, tax judge when there is a dispute about the tax result or the tax decision of the tax inspector, not about complain that another one is not paying enough tax and you would be in the same you would like to be in the same position. Yes. Yeah. You can only That's go to the civil court. Yeah. yeah. Then you I have to say that very very interesting from the Italian point of view because uh, we also have an exclusive jurisdiction competence uh, to settle litigation on tax matters and other matters. And uh, we have the main problem main general problem in Italy is uh, for state debt. We, for fiscal state debt, is we do not have a general action before a court to declare, to, in order to call the player or, uh, or the leader to the DCJ or to the European Commission an exemption granted just to the competitor, not to myself, not to myself. We do not have otherwise this this is a sort of action. Uh, and I will explain uh, that's why this structure of our uh, tax litigation, that, that's why of the structure of that there is no opportunity to do that in mm. And that, that's a great problem. And the DC European Commission has pointed out this problem in Italy because uh, they do not receive from an Italian judge uh, that judge any, any question about uh, any. any Fiscal state that rules for fiscal state that, but that's why for that's why uh, just for the recovery, just for recovery, we have lots of litigation in the for recovery, but not 
to the lawfulness, lawful of the state act. Yeah. And that's why the that's why the structure of our uh, tax litigation procedure, the tax rights, I will explain in detail and something. Well, I think as far as of national procedural rules that they give effective protection and equivalent protection. Um, so if there was a national rule giving the competitor uh, a right to sue, <coughs> you would have to make sure that they could also um, rule, they could also have their European rights ruled on. Um, but when it comes to tax law and state aids uh, at European level, um, the position of the competitor is not very clear. Um, you have to show that you are individually and directly affected by the tax exemption. Um, and um, it's not enough just to say somebody else is getting an advantage. You have to show that you should have it as well. Um, and the courts, the courts have been rather strict in opening that box, and it's really um, only in cases uh, like yes, exactly, where uh, in that laboratoire Baron case, there it was a case where um, if, if if you were a wholesaler of uh, medis medis medical products. Um, who were who were as a, who was obliged under French law to have a whole range, the complete range of medicines in stock. You were allowed to benefit from an exemption, a special tax exemption, uh, but um, nobody else was allowed to benefit from that exemption yeah. because they didn't have the obligation. Uh, but there, the court there, the court said at least the competitor could object. And so the big pharmaceutical companies uh, who didn't, um, who were distributing in France, uh, but didn't, of course, have the whole stock because they weren't going to stock each other's products, they didn't get the advantage. Uh, but that was held to be a possible distortion of competition. Uh, so they were, because there was a, they were in competition, they were indeed, I mean, the whole purpose of the tax exemption was protective to protect. Uh, domestic uh, pharmacy chains, um, but that is a very unusual case um, where you can see that the, there was a direct com the competitors were directly individually affected, uh, and the other is the, the, the straight face case I mentioned, where what we're complaining about is is that the the levy, the parafiscal levy, uh, is being used to finance your competitors. But there you have to show that the government has earmarked the, the proceeds for a particular pot, a particular fund. So if, if the government collects the money and it just goes into, a gen into the general budget, you can't use that argument. So you, you have to show yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's been, being you know, earmarked for a particular yeah. um, purpose yeah. and kept separate. And of course, what governments now do as a result of that litigation is they very rarely set up separate funds, they just mix them all up.